Good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is like church. You know, it's like everybody piles in at the same time. This is good. <laughs> Makes me feel like we're at home, you know, open the, open the window and people will all pile in. So uh, welcome. If you don't have your Bible, oh, go find your Bible. And if you have your Bible, yay. And we're going to start with Matthew 23. So go ahead and uh, open up to Matthew 23. And this is May the 6th, and, and I'm Pastor Susan Langhauser from Advent Lutheran Church. How are you? All righty. So let's open up with a, with a wonderful prayer for this wonderful day. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this new day, for the gift of sunshine and the gift of flowers in our garden. Lord, we thank you for that wonderful place that we can stop in and just sit and enjoy the breezes and the sun and the beauty of your creation. And now we turn, Lord, to the beauty of the message that you have left us in this amazing gift of the scriptures of your holy word in the Bible. We thank you for keeping us uh, close to the story as we continue to try to find our way through uncertain times. We know that there is one thing that is always certain, and that is your testimony of love for us. So in that, in that positive way, in that sure and certain hope, um, we begin our work today and ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see something new in a very old story, but always to see that it is you that we love and us that you love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, hello, everyone. Good to see you all here. See you. See, I can see you in your little pictures that you that come along when you type something to me. And I would ask, we are now trying to track um, people who are present. And a lot of times I know people I see when you come in, sometimes, uh, sometimes not. But I do see if you say, you know, I'm present or hey or whatever. So if you're here, if you would please just make a comment so that I, I know who's coming. We want to kind of make sure that we're reaching out to people who are not um, regularly coming to our live streams. So if you're with us today and you haven't signed in or said good morning or, or sorry, good afternoon or present or, you know, Jesus loves you or give me an emoji about how you're feeling today or just whatever you want to do so that I have a record here of uh, of those of you who are watching today. So again, welcome. Um, we're beginning with Matthew 23 and, um, and I'm glad you're here with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit and then we'll start our conversation and move on. So here we go. Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the places of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. For you do not go in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the sanctuary is bound by nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by the oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that has made the gold sacred? And you say, whoever swears by the altar is bound by nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar is bound by the oath. How blind you are. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the sanctuary swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the th throne of God and by the one who is seated upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. If, you, if it is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets, sages, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town so that upon you may all come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Oh my, yeah. This is a this is a tough section here for us to hear because um, if you have guilt in any things, you're going to hear it. You know, because um, it's 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 pretty it's pretty pointed. Um, so, any easy any easy questions I can start with? I, I do want to take that as a whole because this is is called you know this is the woes to the Pharisees. Um, so I got a couple of notes that I can share with you, but if you have any questions, I'm learning now to wait a little bit because it takes a while for your questions to come across.
Okay, well, let me give you a little, kind of a little context here. Oh, okay, the only thing I think of in hearing this was he must be talking about Congress. <laughs> yeah, a little levity, lighten up the day here. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pam. I needed that. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is really interesting here, about and because I'm always looking at the whole of the of the text of this gospel, um, I like to take the you know the the high looking from a high at 10,000 feet and see what Matthew is doing here as he tells the story. How is he putting this story together? Um, and how does that then reflect um, what he's trying to say? And how does that um, just reinforce the story that he's telling by the way he's telling it and by the order in which he's telling it? Um, I think it's really interesting that just in the very last part of 22, um, Jesus the 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 relig excuse me the religious leadership in Jerusalem who were allied with Rome and that's who he's talking to he's talking to the religious leaders in the temple who have allied themselves with Rome okay so th this is not he's not talking to all Pharisees he's not talking to all Jews he's not talking to the whole uh, people of Israel he's talking to this specific group um, thank you Lloyd for asking that question um, he's he's talking to this specific group of leaders. Um, in the temple who um, were actually getting their pockets lined because they were, you know, doing what Rome wanted them to do. You know, they were being informants. They were, you know, were, they were playing the roles. But at the end of 22, right before we started this chapter in, uh, in verse 46, um, it says, if David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So they, he's just pretty much, you know, closed the casket, you know, and he's ready to move on. And it's kind of like all of a sudden he says, no, I, I need to cleanse the temple in a different way now before I move forward to this, to, to the path that I'm on. So he takes a moment uh, to denounce the the title of my section is to denounce the scribes and the Pharisees, and if you if you look at this, um, this is different. This is also um, Matthew is trying to make sure that we separate here, thinking in terms of the fact that we are Jewish people who are following Jesus, and by the time Matthew writes in eighty or ninety, the temple has been destroyed. We have Jewish, ethnically Jewish people who were following Jesus and yet were continuing to keep the Jewish law. Okay, so we call them, you know, Torah observant Christ believing Jews. That's that's a real simple title for them. But they were Jews, they kept kosher, they kept the Jewish law, and they were continuing to follow um, Jesus. And so they continued to go to the synagogue, they continued to do the festivals, they did all of that stuff. So what Jesus is trying to do now is to, or what Matthew's trying to do now, is to kind of make a distinction between those who have moved forward as Jews, Christian Jews now, um, into the, the community at Antioch, where Matthew is probably writing to these people at Antioch. And they have plenty, they have lots of Christ believing Jews and lots of Gentiles who have come to Christ. Um, so we have all of those followers, but Matthew is particularly concerned about the Jewish followers um, because um, this is not, um, this is kind of the way that Jesus is trying to point out the fact that just because there's this backdrop of religious authority and religious uh, purity that it's not necessarily what it appears to be. Uh, so he really, he's going on the attack. And as I say, I think this is a verbal scourging of the temple, or at least these leaders in the temple, uh, he's trying to, you know, clean it out before, you know, cause the outside looks pretty good, you know, but the inside is, is decaying. So he's, he's wrangling. And if you, if you had, if you look back over chapters 21 and 22, you will see that he has wrangled with almost everybody. He's wrangled with the chief priests and the elders. He's wrangled with the chief priests and the Pharisees. He's wrangled with the Pharisees and the Herodians, and then the Pharisees as a group and the Sadducees as a group. And now in these woes, he's going to include the scribes and the Pharisees. So this is pretty much running the gamut of everybody um, 
who's in the hierarchy of the temple. And there are certain ones who were, were good ones and certain ones that were bad ones. I think it's one of the reasons why John made a point to have the character of Nicodemus's story told as well as a second appearance of Joseph of Arimathea. So at the at the burial of Jesus, when this whole thing has come to its conclusion, or so they think, there are two Pharisees, two members of the Sanhedrin, who are present and who are the ones who take him from the cross and bury his body so that he has that kind of respect. Um, so that we don't get this idea that everybody who was in the authority at the temple was a bad guy. You know, there were, you know, just like in any case, there are some that are good and some that are bad. But this attack that Jesus turns now on these, you know, this this whole structure uh, is is pretty eye opening, you know, for the way he has behaved throughout most of most of Matthew's gospel. Um, but I think one of the things here is for those of you who, who like bringing the story into the present time, um, this is not simply Jesus saying that established religion or organized religion or religious structures are bad. Okay, so we can't take that from this. What we can take is that uh, when religious structures and people are aligned with political oppression, that's not good. Okay, and boy, there you got your comment about <laughs> Congress and the way um, you know religion and politics have become melded together um, far, far too, too closely, um, for my tastes. Um, you know, especially, you know, yes, I'm, I'm, let me just say, I have a position on this, but you know, the conservative right that has, you know, been very, very closely linked with, um, with members of commerce, commerce and, and with the, uh, administration, but, and even that in itself is not bad, but when that is allied with political oppression, and Jesus is against it. Okay, so that's why he's wrangling with all these different groups. And um, and one of the things that I was laughing as I read this because I had a because the language in this part of Matthew is very much so language that appears in all the Gospels and in Paul's letters. I mean, if you wanted to insult somebody, um, you used particular language. Okay. It wasn't just like, you know, so's your old man or whatever. If you insulted somebody, you were insulting them by with using words like blind guides, snakes, hypocrites, deceivers, murderers, you know. And so, you know, it's like, and this is a whole string of Jesus is using a whole string of those to make it very clear that he's not happy with these leaders who are working this way. Um, and I, I, what I was laughing at is there is a wonderful scene. I'm going to I'm going to try to read this to you without just cracking up. But, you know, this is I had a friend in college who was an actor friend. OK, and he had memorized the, a, a speech from Henry the Fourth, part one where, you know, two guys are insulting each other, okay? And here's the insult. You starveling, you eel skin, you dried neat's tongue, you bull's pizzle, you stockfish. Oh, for breath to utter what is like thee. You tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile standing tuck. I mean, wouldn't that be a great way to dress somebody down? They'd be looking at you like, what are you talking about? So anyway, I, that just made me laugh. And I was thinking about that. Here comes Jesus kind of doing that same thing, using snakes, blind guides, hypocrites, you know, that sort of thing. But the um, the the other thing that I want to mention in that regard is this the, Jesus insulting. I know it's hard for us uh, to to see Jesus acting mean, you know, or a lot of us don't like to, you know, it's like it, Jesus wasn't angry when he turned the tables over at the temple. Well, well, it was righteous anger. You know, well, of course, but anger itself is not bad. It's what you do with that anger. And so this kind of wrangling with the, I use the word wrangling because it just seems to be the right thing where he's, he's, um, denouncing them. He's telling them, you know, you are on the wrong path. But the whole thing is to set up this dichotomy of, um, you know, there is a better way to do what you're supposed to be doing. There's a faithful way to do this. There's a way that that goes along with humility and repentance and justice. 
um, which Matthew has a, a very keen interest in. Um, and obviously Jesus did as well. So these are people who have sort of, you know, kind of veered off the path of, that they had started on as they began to work and do their, their ministry within the temple um, apparatus. But I love this because what Jesus is really, you know, really pointing his finger at is not the Jewish nation. And unfortunately, in later days, as the Christian church began to organize and pull itself away from uh, the structure of Judaism as a whole, there was a lot of anti-Semitic response um, to try to make that separation between Jews and the Christian church, you know, completely forgetting that the foundation of the Christian church was the Jewish faith and people who had, who were Jews who then became followers of Jesus. So I think that what we're seeing here is Jesus trying very hard um, to get across the idea that when you hinder God's work or when you try to protect the status quo and that hinders what God is trying to do, that's where Jesus steps in and, and really gets pointed with people. Um, so I want to just go, I want to kind of look at each of these woes and, and maybe give you a little bit more background on, on what might have been happening or what, why he was particular to these particular woes. Um, but, oh, one other comment I want to make about the, the differentiation between Jews and Christians in the early Christian church to separate them. I don't know that they were attempting to diminish Judaism but I think there was a, a very strong sense that Judaism was the foundation and then the blossom of Judaism was Christianity. And I think now one of the good things about ecumenical dialogue and interfaith dialogue is that we can start to see our Jewish brothers and sisters and our Muslim brothers and sisters as, as being all intertwined in the way we relate to God and especially our Jewish brothers and sisters because we are the soil out of which um, Christianity grew. And um, Paul spoke very clearly to that in Romans. If you want to read that section, it's like 9 to 12 in Romans, where he talks about what about the Jews? Are we supposed to try to make them Christians or, or what? And he's very clearly like, no, no. The Jews have their own deal with God. They have their own covenant with God. Um, and you just take care of your own stuff, you know and just be thankful that they were there to move the story along. So this idea of trying to present the Jews as somehow um, examples of deficient Christian piety is, is an anti-Semitic response uh, to trying to do that distinction between the Jews and the Christians of the first century and the second century as the Christian church was growing. So, um, so anyway, that's, you know, and a lot of people will say Matthew, because he was writing specifically for Jews, um, that he has so much anti-Semitic stuff. And, and I think if you really look at what's going on there in Jesus' time, um, that was not Jesus' intent. I think that came later as we started to make the same mistakes that the, the religious establishment in Rome, in Rome were making um, in Jesus' time. So we don't want to make those same mistakes. So um, I don't see any questions. I see. Hi, Akara. Good to see you on the feed. Okay. Um, if you have questions, type them in and I'll, I'll grab them as I, as I go along. Um, the first thing I love is that Jesus uses sarcasm and, you know, most of us have been over the years cautioned that sarcasm is an ugly way to communicate. Um, but sometimes it really does make the point better than any other kind of rhetoric. Um, he says, therefore, he says, whatever they teach you and, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Okay, they they got the authority. They should know what they're doing. Um, therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But don't do as they do. How many of us have, you know, when we talk about raising up our children, you know, and the, the worst thing to do is say, do as I say, not as I do, you know, because basically you're just saying, you know, I can't do it. So why would I expect him to do it or her to do it? No, so that's not a good thing. The best thing to do is lead by example, talk less and act, act the way you want them to act more. Um, so that's kind of what he's calling out, this idea that they, you know, they have taken on these positions and they've gotten sucked into the perks 
of their position and their status. Um, they have, I, you know, they have the the capability of giving people burdens. Says when it talks about, I'm, I'm at uh, verse four now. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. So these heavy burdens would be heavy. Um, they would be supporting Rome's taxation policies. They would be um, attempting to lay down further temple taxes. And, um, you know, like, say, instead of one Hail, Hail Mary, they're saying, say, you know, 150. They have the capability of, you know, if you want to make a sacrifice, um, you're going to pay whatever the priest tells you to pay if you need to do that sacrifice. If it's Passover um, and you need to sacrifice a lamb or if you need to go and bring a couple of pigeons, you really are under the authority and the cost structure that the that the pharisees i mean that the priests give you so sometimes they took advantage of that and they you know they then they pay whatever it was supposed to be for a couple of pigeons and put the rest in their pockets so you know they were lining their own po pockets and benefiting from their position and what they could do um here's a question I, i'm hoping that you all knew this so that you didn't have to ask the question but the phylacteries and fringes these these decorations that they had, um, the phylacteries. I know the Lutheran Study Bible has a nice little uh, deal on the side with a note. It says phylacteries were small cases worn on the arm here, up on the upper arm, and on the forehead. Those little boxes that are tied on with with the rope with the leather strings um, worn on the arm and the forehead, containing quotations from scripture. Um, and with blue cord uh, fringes with blue cords at each corner were to remind people of the commandments while the scribes and the Pharisees may teach correctly. They like to set themselves above others. So oftentimes, even even today, um, it, Orthodox Jewism, Judaism, which uh, especially if you see like in the Jewish sections in New York City and, and places where there's a large Jewish community, Orthodox Jews, you will see them, you know, with the ear curls and the phylactery on their forehead, you know, tied on with a, with a leather strip and then wearing them on their sleeves. Um, so the, the idea is that they're close to the scripture. They have the scripture right, you know, next to their head. So they're constantly reminded of the scriptures. And then Pharisees would wear these long fringes, um, the fringes on their, you know, on their prayer shawls, you know, which they wore all the time tucked into their tunics. Um, so it just, ostentation you know the phylacteries were not unusual to the jews who, who wore them and would wear them to the temple especially if they were going for teaching um but you know they just overdid it so that they made them bigger or they made them out of different materials and and then the fringes were longer than everybody else's and uh, so the pe they became peacocks instead of um instead of teachers and so, you know, you love to have the places of honor and the respect and to be greeted and called rabbi in the marketplaces and get the best seats and that sort of thing. Um, you know, isn't this just a wonderful description of modern day, um, the way we treat our our people, the way we treat, um, you know, our our athletes and our famous people, actors, you know, people who have notoriety, um, we treat them in that way and they and they get used to it. You know, why would they not? So, um, and then he goes into this, um, you, you, you are not to be called rabbi. You shouldn't call anyone on earth your father. And you shouldn't be call anyone teacher because you have, um, your, you have God in heaven is your father and the Messiah is your teacher. So don't think so highly of yourself. And remember that those who make a big deal about themselves are the ones who are going to be humbled and humiliated. And the ones who you know, who know their proper place, um, that those will be exalted. This And think back to the parable of the banquet, where they say, when you come into a banquet, do not take the place of honor, because then what if somebody more honorable than you comes into the room and the host says, oh, you who sat down here in the place of honor, you go down further because now we have someone who really deserves this place of honor. So that sitting in the place of honor, taking on status and privilege and respect where you really don't, you really shouldn't have it um, or, go, or overdoing what you do have 
um, is just not the way that you're supposed to act as a leader. Um, then woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. Um, you don't go in yourselves, but when others are going in, you stop them. And I'm thinking there about, can you just imagine Jesus thinking about all the times when he was healing and he may have healed on the Sabbath and they made a huge deal about him breaking the law by bringing someone back to life or bringing someone back into the fullness of their community and the fullness of life. And after a while, you can imagine that Jesus just had enough. You know, it's like, I'm doing my father's work. Why do you keep, you know, hassling me about doing it, you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing um, about when I do it and how I do it. You know, it's all about the rules. So, um, you know, so you can imagine that he's, he's had it, you know, pretty much up to here. Um, and this whole thing about swearing is it was common practice, I think, um, to swear by the um, vessels in, on the altar, they had different vessels that they, well, think about our altar. We have candlesticks, brass candlesticks. We have a nice brass holder for the missile for, you know, the order of worship that we use. We have beautiful communion ware, uh, you know, so all these wonderful things that are adornments for the altar. Um, and they're, they're, you know, saying, I swear on the brass candlesticks in the church that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Meaning I swear on something of value. Okay, so they're swearing, connecting it to um, an economic principle, something that is worth something. And, you know, Jesus is saying, you don't, you're not even seeing where the worthiness is, where the worth comes from, the value comes from, the altar that was raised for praising God. Whenever anybody in the Old Testament had a vision of God or something, they built an altar. So the altar itself is a symbol of, you know, our worship of God. So he's saying, you know, you, you, you've you lost track of the core of the support of the whole underlying reason we do things. Um, and you're, you've gotten all excited about the frills and, and the cool stuff that's, that's in there. Um, uh, the thing about the mint dill and the, and the spices, I, th I think that's really interesting for you tithe of spices and things that, you know, may be useful to you, but you know, how many times do you hear about mint, dill, and cumin, uh, or cumin, however you pronounce it? It's got two M's here, so I said cumin, but um, you know, these are not spices that were commonly used uh, or commonly mentioned in scripture as being something, you know, like I got to have this every day. I got to have olives. I got to have grapes. I got to, you know, figs, those kinds of things um, were, were commonplace and were necessary for the support of life, but mint, dill, and you know, it's like you're, you'll tithe of the things that are not important to you. You'll tithe. Um, you'll you'll let the stuff go to. <laughs> I just reminded myself of one of the first times we took an in gathering of canned goods, and somebody put a thing of like artichoke hearts, a can of artichoke hearts, into the grocery cart. And I remember when we were putting them into boxes, and I'm thinking. Artichoke hearts, that's something I'm going to go and really be looking for when I go to the food pantry because I don't have enough food. I'm going to go for artichoke hearts. You know, so it's like somebody had that in their pantry, didn't need it or didn't want it and gave it to the poor people. You know, I, what's the big sacrifice there? So I think that's kind of what's going on here. They, they're they very open about tithing of things that have no meaning to them, um, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You know, he's saying, I would rather have you do justice and mercy and keep the faith than worry about the letters of the law, the tithing of the spice or the tithing of, the, you know, whatever. Um, it, so, you know, you're, you're, you're getting lost in the minutia, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. So, you know, I think so these go on and on and on, kind of making the same point or, or just kind of calling out different things. The thing about the inside of the cup being dirty, you, you know, you worry about washing the outside of the cup, um, the temple, make the temple beautiful. Everything's great. But the inside of the temple where they're working, where they're doing their task and in, in undercover of that glorious building and establishment, 
um, you know, they're not, they don't worry about that. And that's really what they ought to be doing. So um, more the same at 27, 28. Um, and then this whole thing about the prophets and building tombs and decorating the graves of the righteous and everything. And then they used to swear on their ancestors and say, you know, someone would say, well, your ancestor killed, killed the prophets. They say, yeah, well, if I wasn't there, if I was there, I would not have killed the prophets. That was my ancestors. That wasn't me. You know, so it's kind of like, yeah, okay. But if you're going to claim them as your ancestors that you, you know, are claiming that respect and claiming that lineage, then you're also claiming how they acted and what they did. Um, so all of this, Jesus is just, you know, pounding on them. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. You all are a bunch of snakes and vipers and hypocrites. And then the chapter ends with Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. Um, I'm sorry that in this one, it doesn't say that he wept. But in, other, in the other synoptic gospels, when he comes to Jerusalem and he's, you know, apparently just kind of looking over the city from the Temple Mount, um, this is Jerusalem is where they kill the prophets and stone those who have come to speak to power in Jerusalem. How often have I desired to gather your children together, the children of Jerusalem, okay? As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. So here's a, a beautiful picture of Jesus describing how God acts. You know, that God acts, even the unruly, even the, you know, the snakes and the vipers and the, and the murderers and, you know, all of those names that he called them. How often have I desired to gather you all under my wings, but you would not let me, you know, and then he, he weeps in the other synoptics. But the other thing that's cool is um, Jesus himself uses the image of a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, a feminine image for God. Um, there are a number of them in scripture, but not enough. <laughs> so it's nice every once in a while as a woman to hear Jesus talk about God doing feminine things, doing female kinds of things. Not that men don't do that, but, you know, men, you aren't hens. You know, you could be a rooster, but I don't know that roosters gather their chicks under their wings. Maybe I'm wrong, um, but I don't think I've ever heard stories about that. So, um, so he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So this section, as it began with him entering into Jerusalem and people shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He basically, you know, calls all the leadership hypocrites and places woe on their heads and then tells them, you know, you're not going to see me again. But here's the hope, even for them. Until you say, you will not see me again, until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, as if it's a fait accompli. There's going to come a time when you too will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's kind of, that's kind of a cool thing too, when you're thinking about all these, um, you know, he's beaten on it, beaten on it, beaten on him. But there's also that underlying idea that Whenever they're ready, you know, God is right there waiting, you know, just waiting for them to say, okay, I get it now. So questions, comments, I have overwhelmed you. You're either sleeping or you're not asking questions. <laughs> Shall we continue? We've got, oh, we got, we got time. Okay, the next section is even more fun because <laughs> now we're moving into um, this would be what we call um, the apocalyptic stage um, that, where we're talking about the end of the world. We're talking about second coming, the parousia. Parousia is the Greek word for um, para or around and and through. Usia is like... Um, the being, the the essence. So coming around to the essence, coming to the climax, okay, coming to the end of the story where everything is revealed, 
you know, and, and everybody knows what the story was about. So Perusia is, we use it just to basically use that as a stand in for the, the, the end of the world or the second coming. End times, I would say. So I'm gonna take this in a couple of smaller pieces so that I don't overwhelm you <laughs> with information. Um, and, and you can ask questions if you have some. So here we go, the destruction of the temple being foretold. Um, this is, um, again, remember, Matthew is writing after the destruction of the temple. And he's writing to a bunch of people who um, probably had already been invited to leave their synagogues okay so these the jews who became followers of jesus continued to worship in their synagogues for for some time uh after jesus went was ascended and then it just got to the point where they just they they couldn't communicate together they couldn't be they couldn't work in community together because there were too many differences and too many philosophical arguments um so the synagogues um, basically excluded them and 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 kicked them out. Let's just say that they kicked them out. So then they oftentimes went would move or would go someplace where there was a, a growing Christian community so they could feel better about what where they were and how they were worshiping and that sort of thing. So um, which is kind of interesting because it's almost like the exodus out of Egypt. Not that they were in slavery to Judaism, but they're in a place where they've been contributing and being part of the community and working as a piece of the organism of the synagogue. And at a certain point, because they want to worship the way they want to worship and the synagogue won't let them, then they have to get they have their own exodus and they went to all kinds of different places and started the beginning of the diaspora of the Jews, of the Jews and the Jewish Christians. So um, that, that was all happening in the first century after Jesus ascended. So that happened, you know, 35 to 40, I'd say in that five to 10 year period, 35 to 45 or 50, about the time that they were being expelled almost completely out of the synagogues is when Paul was writing his letters. And that's why it so, was so important that he was starting to plant churches um, all over with his travels so that as people were being, you know, booted out of their synagogues, that there were these little communities, you know, not too far from Jerusalem where they could go and make a new life and have a place where they could worship in the Christian faith and, and do and follow Jesus. So that's why Paul was so important, not only to the Gentile, the movement of the church out into the Gentile world, but into receiving those uh, Christ believing Jews who and now had no place to be in community and had no place to worship in their Christian beliefs. So uh, important stuff. So now as the, as the, uh, as we move to that, let's, so, so let's, let's just say that's between 30 and 50 that that's happening. Paul's in there between 50 and 60. The destruction of the temple happens. Rome finally has had enough with Jerusalem and Judea and they, you know, raise the temple to the ground. So the temple, this huge, amazing building is just absolutely decimated and, and leveled. That brought on a whole bunch of different things, that destruction of the temple. And so part of the reason why we have the Gospels at all um, is because the temple was destroyed. Now there was no place for the word, the, you know, the teaching and the whole religious uh, life to flow from because it all was centered in Jerusalem. It's why they kept coming back to Jerusalem on these pilgrimages for festivals, for the Passover, for Sukkot, you know, for all the festivals. Three times a year, they would travel from all around um, Israel, Judea, um, to come to Jerusalem for the festival. So everybody came to one place to worship together, to be in community together, to hear teaching, you know, and it was like a huge big event. Now they have no place to do that. You know, the temple is gone. So the synagogue system remained after 70 um, and the and teachers who had been teaching there, you know, stayed with their synagogues um, and some of the religious establishment continued and went out into the city. So they already had this um, regionalized 
religious system in place. But in by the time they started figuring out how are we going to continue the faith? Are we going to use the synagogue system? How are we going to do that? How are we going to do festivals? How are we going to do what we used to do in Jerusalem? It took another 20 years. And they held, held a council in a town called Jamnia, uh, where they decided that the Pharisees, that was, you know, again, a kind of a religious political community of people with one sort of group of philosophy and religious philosophy and teachings. They were the interpreters of the law who were the most universal, I would say, as far as how they were diversified and, and bringing other people into the law and that sort of thing. The Pharisees, that movement was the one that kind of won the day as to how we were going to move the faith forward. The Sadducees kind of went to the side um, you know, there were other things and, and that's where we get two different kind of, or actually two or many more after that, um, understandings of Judaism, um, Hillel and Shammai, I think was the other one. Um, these two kind of big tap roots that came out of the, out of the ground and probably all of modern day Ju Judaism comes from one or the other of those roots. I'm not real versed about that particular time. Um, but I'm sure you could find it if you're interested in what, you know, how that happened after the Council of Jamnia, J-A-M-N-I-A. But the Pharisaic Judaism is really what has survived to this day. Uh, and I think uh, if you have Jewish friends, you could talk to them about that, how that moved forward. Anyway, so now we've got Matthew and Luke writing um, 85, 90. So right before the Jewish leftover, you know, what the remnant of Judaism, not Christian Jews, but the remnant of Judaism is, is kind of doesn't know what to do. It's kind of in, kind of in a situation that we're sort of in now, or we're getting a little taste of with this idea of what's going to happen to the church uh, when we can't live the way we used to live. Um, when we can't do the kinds of things that were important in the rituals of the church, how are we going to do this? And will the church survive? Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's kind of an interesting parallel, I think, that we've never really pondered before, because before the council, um, the Jews were really trying to figure out how they were going to do Judaism without having the center of Jerusalem, the temple of Jerusalem. Um, so now we've got Matthew using the story of Jesus to kind of help the people who have gone through this tumultuous time from Jesus life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and then following that, you know, the removal from the synagogue of the Jewish Christians, Paul writing, trying to interpret what happened with Jesus and his crucifixion and resurrection, and then now we have stories of the backstory of Jesus. I mean, everybody knew Jesus died, Jesus was raised, he continued to live among us, and then he went back to God. Everybody knew that part, but all the other stuff, the teaching and stuff like that, now we're beginning to lose the first group of eyewitnesses. Um, we're a generation past those, those people, Peter and Paul and all those guys. So we now we need to do something to make sure that the faith is transmitted. Just exactly the same thing that the Jewish nation was trying to do. How are we going to transmit and transfer the faith to the, to the following generations who don't have the temple? which is what we've had for centuries, okay? So the Christian church is doing the exact same thing. How are we going to now transmit the faith since the eyewitnesses, um, those who were his disciples, the apostles, those who were with him are starting to die away. And we need to preserve the story so that we can tell it in its purity um, to the generations that come behind us. So that's why Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, each telling the story in a kind of a little bit of a different way to address the needs of a particular community is so important. Um, it all, it opens up the idea that, that interpretation is the way to communicate the way God wants to communicate. God wants this to be personal for us. God doesn't want to just say, here's a story. You have to learn the story exactly the way it came down to you. You have to memorize the words and, you know, and if it doesn't, necessarily fit your situation at this time, oh, that's just too bad. You have to make it work for you. That's not the way God acts. 
you know, God wants to be in this relationship, which is dynamic at all the time. So um, <laughs> Advent Olathe, that's Dorothy Clopton. I don't know if you guys know that Advent Olathe comment. Dorothy's um, posting some other things for Advent. So she's now posting as Advent. So uh, figuring out how to do worshiping differently sounds familiar is what she said. And that's kind of where I was going. Uh, Dorothy, I'll show you how to do that differently if you don't want to be Advent Olathe when you post on stuff. Um, okay, so we're getting ready now to go back to, to Jesus time and his looking at the lament over Jerusalem. And now I look at the clock and I'm thinking, oh, well, it's really too late now to go into chapter 24. <laughs> but I think this foundation is helpful as we move into this. So now just keep in mind again, this is where the layers become important. We got the layer of Jesus, okay? And then we've got the layer of Matthew writing about Jesus. And then we've got us here reading and talking about what Matthew said about Jesus. So now we're going to go back to the world of the text when we start again in um, in 24 next next Wednesday. So um, I hope that I hope that's helpful. Um, and I hope you have a really wonderful day for the rest of the day. I'm going to, now I'm going to just go ahead and end a little bit early because I don't want to get started in 24. So we will do that next Wednesday. Hope you all are doing well. Um, you know, now is a time where it's getting a little weird, um, as people start to talk about going out, opening the economy, blah, blah, blah. And I know there are people who are very concerned about that and about how we're going to open church and that sort of thing. The staff has been working on how we're going to roll out, you know, being able to be together in a safe way. Please know that we are not going to do anything that will put you in danger or put you in an unsafe situation. Um, it may mean that it's going to take us a little bit longer to, to get, you know, we're not going to just open the doors some Sunday and everybody's going to come back and it's going to be great. You know, I mean, everybody will do that at some point, but we're not doing that on one Sunday. So um, we will have a council meeting next Monday night. And after that, the council will approve or disapprove or come up with the rollout plan the way we see it. But we're going to do it very slowly. Uh, we're going to abide by the guidelines of both Johnson County and Kansas. Um, but I know some of that is is producing some anxiety for people. What will I do? People are inviting me to come to do something and I really don't want to do it. How can I, what, what kind of excuse can I give them for saying, no, I don't want to go to church. I mean, I want to go to church, but I don't want to go to church. I'm scared to go to church. Um, and I don't, you know, I just don't feel right about it. So please know that that is perfectly fine. We are going to continue the live worship feeds, this feed, um, you know, the kinds of things that I've been doing, the, the devotions and this study will continue online until it is completely safe. And people are going, why are you still doing that online? Because I want to come in person. <laughs> um, so we've got time. OK, we're going to take the time. Where have you heard that before? Um, and we're going to do this slowly and safely. OK, so and Delise, it's wonderful to see you from Nebraska. Thanks for doing this. It's nice to see your face and your name. Uh, a former member of Advent who's living in Nebraska. So uh, once again, I hope you all have a great day. I will see you next Wednesday. Actually, I will see you tomorrow morning if you're doing devotions. Um, and then I'll see, and, or you'll see me. And then you'll see me again on Sunday. And you'll see me again here next week. So I miss you. I love you. And thank you for being involved and uh, taking part in Wednesdays at 1. Next week, Matthew 24, the parousia. I'll see ya. <laughs>